Education. What does it mean to be educated? Who has access to a good education slash and why? E. 0 U. Minus 6 pound L. L. I. A. 0. C U colon I. Q. Students do not always get a chance to step back and reflect on the many elements that shape the educational system elements that at this very moment affect what you are learning, how you are learning it, and the kind of educated person you will be when you graduate. The readings in this chapter take a range of approaches to two central questions, what does it mean to be educated? Who in the United States has access to a good education? and why. Mark Edmundson launches the chapter with a provocative question. Who are you and what are you doing here? A word to the incoming class. In this lively essay, he challenges new college students to reconsider their ideas of what college is for and proposes that to get a real. 404 Chapter 14 Education Edmundson. Who are you and what are you doing here? 405. Education, you may have to work against the comforts of your university, and perhaps even the expectation that landing a specific job is the point of a college degree. Edmundson argues for something more transformative the quest at the center of a liberal arts education is not a luxury quest it a necessity quest. You will be able to discover whether you agree. Laura Papineau also examines university life, but she focuses on what happens outside the classroom in the realm of big-time college sports. Papineau asks why campus identity so often revolves around sports rather than academic accomplishments. Try to imagine what Mark Edmundson's answer to that question might be. Whether or not you are a sports fan, the data Papineau offers should make you think carefully about the money in college athletics and the campus traditions that so often interfere with the academic pursuits of both athletes and fans. What is college for? The other authors in this chapter invite you to consider your earlier educational experiences and to recognize that they unfold in a nation of profound inequalities. Although public education is widely thought to be the most crucial element of a democracy, clearly not all public education in the United States is equal. Two short opinion columns from the New York Times offer different perspectives on the income gap and public education, Susan Dynarski's Why American Schools Are Even More Unequal Than We Thought and a piece titled The Good News About Educational Inequality, co-authored by Sean Reardon, Jane Waldfogel, and Daphna Basak. Both essays consider the long-term effects of childhood poverty on education. After some consideration, you may find that while these pieces examine different data, they might find common ground on solutions. The final selection in this chapter, by Nicole Hannah-Jones, is a close analysis of the adjoining school districts in Missouri that made national news because of the shooting death of Michael Brown in Ferguson. What does Michael Brown's death have to do with education? Hannah Jones takes readers on a historical exploration of the myriad political and social shifts in this portion of the country that demonstrate how race and social class so often stack the deck against generations of Americans. The world Hannah Jones paints may seem far away from the collegiate concerns of grade inflation or tailgating that Edmundson and Papineau write about, but they are certainly connected. All the writers in this chapter push us to ask what it means in con. KDS temporary culture to be educated and who has access to which in. Of education. These readings should help you see your past and priest educational experiences through fresh eyes and consider the relationship between education and social power. What do you think it should mean to H.U.
be an educated person in the contemporary United States? YAVD Come to accept such profound inequalities in our educational system, and what might create change? Mark Edmundson Who are you and what are you doing here? A word to the incoming class. Mark Edmundson is an award-winning professor of English at the University of Virginia who writes literary criticism and publishes on a wide range of cultural topics, including the power of profanity, the meanings of football, and the politics of reading and writing. Edmundson has written many popular press books on the business of teaching and learning. Who are you and what are you doing here? A Word to the Incoming Class is a chapter from Why Teach? In Defense of a Real Education, 2013. In it, you will hear Edrenun Sun's very distinctive voice, which can be funny as well as sharply critical. He enjoys the role of cultural gadfly and hopes to provoke readers particularly students to reconsider their goals. This essay is written as a word to the incoming class. As you read, imagine what your response would be if someone spoke these words at your own college orientation. Just a few paragraphs in, Edmundson claims that not only are you going to have to fight to get a real education, but you will very likely have to fight against the institution that you find yourself in. His definition of what a real education is emerges throughout the essay. As you read, keep track of his ideas, but also measure them against your own beliefs. What exactly are you hoping to get out of college? Where do you agree and disagree with Edrenunson's strongly worded ideas? Throughout the essay, Edmundson moves between reflections on past conversations with his father before he started his own college career and a current argument that a real education means more than getting a job or becoming a success, if that is measured only in material gains, para 10. Edmundson has equal criticism for students, professors, and even administrators who, he claims, miss the enormous transformative potential of education. What complaints does he lodge against each of these groups, and how fair is he, given your experience? Because this is an article for a general readership, Edmundson does not quote other scholars at length or cite them in a bibliography or works cited page. However, he does draw on a wide range of literary and cultural references and assumes his readers know what he means when he refers to Foucault, Parad 28-29, or Schopenhauer, Burke, Emerson, Dick Tunson, Blake, Thoreau, and especially Freud. Do you usually look up names and words you don't know? How might your willingness or unwillingness to do this extra work be connected to Edrenun Sun's argument about real education? Near his conclusion, Edmundson admits, the whole business is scary, of course, if we take on the challenge of education as the kind of self-transformation he calls for. It may be a challenge to square your own ideals with the real ear f. Show IESO supper to G yourself as an ad underscore ULT. However, EDMNDS, N argues we. TH old refuse this dichotomy between ideals and practicality, the quest at E center of a liberal arts education is not a luxury quest, it's a necessity quest paragraph 27. Understanding what he means could change your life. 406 Chapter 14 Education Welcome and congratulations, getting to the first day of college is a one major achievement. You're to be commended, and not just you, but the parents, grandparents, uncles and aunts who helped get you here. It's been said that raising a child effectively takes a village, well, as you may second have noticed, 
our American village is not in very good shape. We've got guns, drugs, wars, fanatical religions, a slime-based popular culture, and some politicians who a little restraint here aren't what they might be. Merely to survive in this American village and to win a place in the entering class has taken a lot of grit on your part. So, yes, congratulations to all. You now may think that you've about got it made. Amid the impressive three college buildings, in company with a high-powered faculty, surrounded by the best of your generation, all you need is to keep doing what you've done before, work hard, get good grades, listen to your teachers, get along with the people around you, and you'll emerge in four years as an educated young man or woman. Ready for life. Do not believe it. It is not true. If you want to get a real education in for America, you're going to have to fight and I don't mean just fight against the drugs and the violence and against the slime-based culture that is still going to surround you. I mean something a little more disturbing. To get an education, you're probably going to have to fight against the institution that you find yourself in no matter how prestigious it may be. In fact, the more prestigious the school, the more you'll probably have to push. You can get a terrific education in America now there are astonishing opportunities at almost every college but the education will not be presented to you wrapped and bowed. To get it, you'll need to struggle and strive, to be strong, and occasionally even to piss off some admirable people. I came to college with few resources, but one of them was an under five standing, however crude, of how I might use my opportunities there. This I began to develop because of my father, who had never been to college in fact, he'd barely gotten out of high school. One night after dinner, he and I were sitting in our kitchen at 58 Cluley Road in Medford, Massachusetts hatching plans about the rest of my life. I was about to go off to college. A feat no one in my family had accomplished in living memory. I think I might want to be pre-law, I told my father. I had no idea what being pre-law was. My father compressed his brow and blew twin streams of smoke, dragon-like, from his magnificent nose. Do you want to be a lawyer? he asked. My father had some experience with lawyers and with policemen, too, he was not well disposed toward either. T.M. not really sure, I told him, but lawyers make pretty good money, right? My father detonated. That was not uncommon. He detonated a lot. Six he told me that I was going to go to college only once, and that while I was there I had better study what I wanted. He said that when rich kids went to school, they majored in the subjects that interested them, and that my Edmundson Who are you and what are you doing here? 407 Younger brother Philip and I were as good as any rich kids. We were rich kids minus the money. Wasn't I interested in literature? I confessed that I was. Then I had better study literature, unless I had inside information to the effect that reincarnation wasn't just hype, and I'd be able to attend college thirty or forty times. If I had such info, pre-law would be fine, and maybe even a tour through invertebrate biology could also be tossed in. But until I had the reincarnation stuff from a solid source, I better get to work and pick out some English classes from the course catalog. How about the science requirements? I asked. Take M later, he said. You never know s my father, right Auchenhead Edmundson, Malden High School Class 9. Of 1948, by a hair, knew the score. 
What he told me that evening at the Cluley Road kitchen table was true in itself, and it also contains the germ of an idea about what a university education should be. But apparently almost everyone else students, teachers, trustees, and parents see the matter much differently. They have it wrong. Education has one salient enemy in present-day America, and that ten enemy is education university education in particular. To almost everyone, university education is a means to an end. For students, that end is a good job. Students want the credentials that will help them get ahead. They want the certificate that will grant them access to Wall Street, or entrance into law or medical or business school. And how can we blame them? America values power and money, big players with big bucks. When we raise our children, we tell them in multiple ways that what we want most for them is success material success. To be poor. In America is to be a failure. It's to be without decent health care, without basic necessities, often without dignity. Then there are those back-breaking student loans, people leave school as servants, indentured to pay massive bills, so that first job better be a good one. Students come to college with the goal of a diploma in mind what happens to them. In between, especially in classrooms, is often of no deep and determining interest to them. In college, life is elsewhere. Life is at parties, at clubs, in music, with eleven friends, in sports. Life is what celebrities have. The idea that the courses you take should be the primary objective of going to college is tacitly considered absurd. In terms of their work, students live in the future and not the present, they live with their prospects for success. If universities stopped issuing credentials, half of the clients would be gone by tomorrow morning, with the remainder following fast behind. The faculty, too, is often absent, their real lives are also elsewhere. Twelve like most of their students, they aim to get on. The work they are compelled to do to advance get tenure, promotion, raises, outside offers is, broadly speaking, scholarly work. No matter what anyone says, this work has precious little to do with the fundamentals of teaching. The proof is that virtually no undergraduate students can read and understand there. 7. 408 Chapter 14 Education Professor's Scholarly Publications The public senses this disparity and so thinks of the professor's work as being silly or beside the point. Some of it is. But the public also senses that because professors don't pay full bore attention to teaching, they don't have to work very hard they ve created a massive feather bed for themselves and called it a university. This is radically false. Ambitious professors, the ones who, like their 13 students, want to get ahead in America, work furiously. Scholarship, even. If pretentious and almost unreadable, is nonetheless labor-intense. One can slave for a year or two on a single article for publication in this or that refereed journal. These essays are honest, their footnotes reflect real reading, real assimilation, and real dedication. Shoddy work in which the author cheats, cuts corners, copies from others is quickly detected. The people who do the work have highly developed intellectual powers, and they push themselves hard to reach a certain standard. That the results have almost no practical relevance for students, the public, or even, frequently, other scholars is a central element in the tragicomedy that is often academia. The students and the professors have made a deal, 
neither of them 14 has to throw himself heart and soul into what happens in the classroom. The students write their abstract, over-intellectualized essays, the professors grade the students for their capacity to be abstract and over-intellectual and often genuinely smart. For their essays can be brilliant, in a chilly way, they can also be clipped from the internet, and often are. Whatever the case, no one wants to invest too much in them for life is elsewhere. The professor saves his energies for the profession, while the student saves his for friends, social life, volunteer work, making connections, and getting in position to clasp hands on the true grail, the first job. No one in this picture is evil, no one is criminally irresponsible. It's ones just that smart people are prone to look into matters to see how they might go about buttering their toast. Then they butter their toast. As for the administrators, their relation to the students often seems 16 based not on love but fear. Administrators fear bad publicity, scandal and dissatisfaction on the part of their customers. More than anything else, though, they fear lawsuits. Throwing a student out of college for this or that piece of bad behavior is very difficult, almost impossible. The student will sue your eyes out. One kid I knew, and rather liked, threatened on his blog to mince his dear and esteemed professor, me, with the samurai sword for the crime of having taught a boring class. The class was a little boring I had a damn cold but the punishment seemed a bit severe. The dean of students laughed lightly when I suggested that this behavior might be grounds for sending the student on a brief vacation. I was, you might say, discomfited and showed up to class for a while with my cell phone jiggered to dial 911 with one touch. Still, this was small potatoes. Colleges are even leery of disciplining slash seven guys who have committed sexual assault, or assault plain and simple. Edmundson. Who are you and what are you doing here? 409. Instead of being punished, these guys frequently stay around, strolling the quad and swilling the libations, an affront and sometimes a terror, to their victims. You'll find that cheating is common as well. As far as I can discern, 18 the student ethos goes like this, if the professor is so lazy that he gives the same test every year, it's okay to go ahead and take advantage UVE got better things to do. The internet is a muck with services selling term papers, and those services exist, capitalism being what it is because people purchase the papers lots of them. Fraternity files bulge with old tests from a variety of courses. Periodically, the public gets exercised about this situation and there are articles in the national news. But then interest dwindles and matters go back to normal. One of the reasons professors sometimes look the other way when 19 they sense cheating is that it sends them into a world of sorrow. A friend of mine had the temerity to detect cheating on the part of a kid who was the nephew of a well-placed official in an Arab government complexly aligned with the U.S. black limousines pulled up in front of his office and disgorged decorously suited negotiators. Did my pal fold? No. He's not the type. But he did not enjoy the process. What colleges generally want are well-rounded students, civic leaders, 20 people who know what the system demands, how to keep matters light and not push too hard for an education or anything else, people who get their credentials and leave professors alone to do their brilliant work so they may rise and enhance the rankings of the university. Such students leave and become donors and so, in their own turn, contribute immeasurably to the university's standing. 
They've done a fine job skating on surfaces in high school the best way to get an across-the-board outstanding record and now they're on campus to cut a few more figure eights. In a culture where the major and determining values are monetary, 21 what else could you do? How else would you live if not by getting all you can, succeeding all you can, making all you can? The idea that a university education really should have no substantial 22 content, should not be about what John Keats was disposed to call soul-making, is one that you might think professors and university presidents would be discreet about. Not so. This view informed an address that Richard Broadhead gave to the senior class at Yale before he departed to become president of Duke. Broadhead an impressive, articulate man, seems to take. As his educational touchstone the Duke of Wellington's precept that the Battle of Waterloo was won on the playing fields of Eden. Broadhead suggests that the content of the course isn't really what matters. In five years, or five months, or minutes, the student is likely to have forgotten how to do the problem sets and will only hazily recollect what happens in the ninth book of Paradise Lost. The legacy of their college years will be a legacy of difficulties overcome. When they face equally arduous tasks later in life, students will tap their old resources of determination, and they'll win. 410 Chapter 14 Education All right. There's nothing wrong with this as far as it goes after all. 23 The student who writes a brilliant 40-page thesis in a hard week has learned more than a little about her inner resources. Maybe it will give her needed confidence in the future. But doesn't the content of the courses matter at all? On the evidence of this talk, no. Trying to figure out whether the stuff 24 you're reading is true or false and being open to having your life changed is a fraught, controversial activity. Doing so requires energy from the professor which is better spent on other matters. This kind of perspective-altering teaching and learning can cause the things that administrators fear above all else, trouble, arguments, bad press, etc. After the Kid Samurai episode, the chair of my department not unsympathetically suggested that this was the sort of incident that could happen when you brought a certain intensity to teaching. At the time I found this remark a tad detached, but maybe he was right. So if you want an education, the odds aren't with you, the professors 25 are off doing what they call their own work. The other students, who've doped out the way the place runs, are busy leaving their professors alone and getting themselves in position for bright and shining futures, the student services people are trying to keep everyone content, offering plenty of entertainment and building another state-of-the-art workout facility every few months. The development office is already scanning you for future donations. So why make trouble? Why not just go along? Let the profs roam free 26. In the realms of pure thought, let yourselves party in the realms of impure pleasure, and let the student services gang assert fewer prohibitions and newer delights for you. You'll get a good job, you'll have plenty of friends, you'll have a driveway of your own. You'll also, if my father and I are right, be truly and righteously 27 screwed. The reason for this is simple. The quest at the center of a liberal arts education is not a luxury quest, it's a necessity quest. If you do not undertake it, you risk leading a life of desperation maybe quiet, maybe. In time, very loud and I am not exaggerating. For you risk trying to be someone other than who you are, which, in the long run, is killing. By the time you come to college, 
you will have been told who you are two's numberless times. Your parents and friends, your teachers, your counselors, your priests and rabbis and ministers and imams have all had their say. They've let you know how they size you up, and they've let you know what they think you should value. They've given you a sharp and protracted taste of what they feel is good and bad, right and wrong. Much is on their side. They have confronted you with scripture's holy books that, whatever their actual provenance, have given people what they feel to be wisdom for thousands of years. They've given you family traditions uve learned the ways of your tribe and community. And, too, you've been tested, probed, looked at up and down and through. The Coach Edmundson who are you and what are you doing here? 411. Knows what your athletic prospects are, the guidance office has a sheaf of test scores that relegate you to this or that ability quadrant, and your teachers have got you pegged. You are, as Foucault might say, the intersection of many evaluative and potentially determining discourses, you, boy, you, girl have been made. And contra Foucault that's not so bad. Embedded in all of the 29 major religions are profound truths. Schopenhauer, who despised belief in transcendent things, nonetheless taught Christianity to be of inexpressible worth. He couldn't believe in the divinity of Jesus or in the afterlife, but to Schopenhauer, a deep pessimist, a religion that had as its central emblem the figure of a man being tortured on a cross couldn't be entirely misleading. To the Christian, Schopenhauer said, pain was at the center of the understanding of life, and that was just as it should be. One does not need to be as harsh as Schopenhauer to understand the thirty use of religion, even if one does not believe in an otherworldly God. And all those teachers and counselors and friends and the prognosticating uncles, the dithering aunts, the fathers and mothers with their hopes for your fulfillment, or their fulfillment in you should not necessarily be cast aside or ignored. Families have their wisdom. The question who do they think you are at home, is never an idle one. The major conservative thinkers have always been very serious about 31 what goes by the name of common sense. Edmund Burke saw common sense as a loosely made but often profound collective work in which humanity deposited its hard-earned wisdom the precipitate of joy and tears over time. You have been raised in proximity to common sense. If you've been raised at all, and common sense is something to respect, though not quite peace unto the formidable Burke to revere. You may be all that the good people who raised you say you are, you thirty-two may want all they have shown you is worth wanting, you may be someone who is truly your father's son or your mother's daughter. But then again, you may not be. For the power that is in you, as Emerson suggested, may be new thirty-three in nature. You may not be the person that your parents take you to be. And this thought is both more exciting and more dangerous you may not be the person that you take yourself to be, either. You may not have read yourself or right, and college is the place where you can find out whether you have or not. The reason to read Blake and Dickinson and Freud and Dickens is not to become more cultivated or more articulate or to be someone who, at a cocktail party, is never embarrassed, or can embarrass others. The best reason to read them is to see if they know you better than you know yourself. You may find your own suppressed and rejected thoughts following back to you with an alienated majesty. Reading the great writers, you may have the experience Longinus associated with the sublime, you feel that you have actually created the text yourself. For somehow your predecessors are more yourself than you are. 
412 Chapter 14 Education This was my own experience reading the two writers who have inflow. 34 inst me the most, Sigmund Freud and Ralph Waldo Emerson. They gave words to thoughts and feelings that I had never been able to render myself. They shone a light onto the world, and what they saw, suddenly I saw, too. From Emerson I learned to trust my own thoughts, to trust them even when every voice seems to be on the other side. I need the wherewithal. As Emerson did, to say what's on my mind and to take the inevitable hits. Much more I learned from the sage about character, about loss, about joy, about writing, and its secret sources, but Emerson most centrally preaches the gospel of self-reliance, and that is what I have tried most to take from him. I continue to hold in mind one of Emerson's most memorable passages, Society is a joint stock company, in which the members agree, for the better securing of his bread to each shareholder, to surrender the liberty and culture of the eater. The virtue in most request is conformity. Self-reliance is its aversion. It loves not realities and creators, but names and customs. Emerson's greatness lies not only in showing you how powerful names 35 and customs can be, but also in demonstrating how exhilarating it is to buck them. When he came to Harvard to talk about religion, he shocked the professors and students by challenging the divinity of Jesus and the truth of his miracles. He wasn't invited back for decades. From Freud I found a great deal to ponder as well. I don't mean 36 Freud the aspiring scientist, but the Freud who was a speculative essayist and interpreter of the human condition like Emerson. Freud challenges nearly every significant human ideal. He goes after religion. He says that it comes down to the longing for the father. He goes after love. He calls it the overestimation of the erotic object. He attacks our desire for charismatic popular leaders. We're drawn to them because we hunger for absolute authority. He declares that dreams don't predict the future and that there's nothing benevolent about them. They're disguised fulfillments of repressed wishes. Freud has something challenging and provoking to say about virtually 37. Every human aspiration. I learned that if I wanted to affirm any consequential ideal, I had to talk my way past Freud. He was an is aper. Petual challenge and goad. Never has there been a more shrewd and imaginative cartographer of 38. The Psyche. His separation of the self into three parts, and his sense of the fraught, anxious, but often negotiable relations among them, negotiable when you come to the game with a Freudian knowledge, does a great deal to help one navigate experience. Though sometimes and I owe this to Emerson, it seems right to let the psyche fall into civil war accepting barrages of anxiety and grief for this or that good reason. The battle is to make such writers one's own, to winnow them out 39 and to find their essential truths. We need to see where they fall short and where they exceed the mark, and then to develop them a little, as the ideas themselves, one comes to see, actually developed others. Both Emerson Edmundson who are you and what are you doing here? 413. And Freud live out of Shakespeare but only a giant can be truly influenced by Shakespeare. In reading, I continue to look for one thing to be influenced, to learn something new, to be thrown off my course and onto another, better way. My father knew that he was dissatisfied with life. He knew that none forty of the descriptions people had for him quite fit. 
he understood that he was always out of joint with life as it was. He had talent, my brother and I each got about half the raw ability he possessed, and that's taken us through life well enough. But what to do with that talent there was the rub for my father. He used to stroll through the house intoning his favorite line from Groucho Marx's ditty whatever it is, I'm against it. I recently asked my son, now 21, if he thought I was mistaken in teaching him this particular song when he was six years old. No, he said, filling the air with an invisible forest of exclamation points. But what my father never managed to get was a sense of who he might become. He never had a world of possibilities spread before him never made sustained contact with the best that has been thought and said. He didn't get to revise his understanding of himself, figure out what he'd do best that might give the world some profit. My father was a gruff man but also a generous one, so that night at 41 the kitchen table at 58 Cluley Road he made an effort to let me have the chance that had been denied to him by both fate and character. He gave me the chance to see what I was all about, and if it proved to be different from him, proved even to be something he didn't like or entirely comprehend, then he'd deal with it. Right now, if you're going to get a real education, you may have to be 42 aggressive and assertive. Your professors will give you some fine books to read, and they'll prob 43 ably help you understand them. What they won't do, for reasons that perplex me, is ask you if the books contain truths you could live your life by. When you read Plato, you'll probably learn about his metaphysics and his politics and his way of conceiving the soul. But no one will ask you if his ideas are good enough to believe in. No one will ask you, in the words of Emerson's disciple William James, what their cash value might be. No one will suggest that you might use Plato as your Bible for a week or a year. Or longer. No one, in short, will ask you to use Plato to help you change your life. That will be up to you. You must put the question of Plato to your 44 self. You must ask whether reason should always rule the passions, philosophers should always rule the state, and poets should inevitably be banished from a just commonwealth. You have to ask yourself if wildly expressive music, rock and rap and the rest, deranges the soul in ways that are destructive to its health. You must inquire of yourself if balanced calm is the most desirable human state. Occasionally for you will need some help in fleshing out the N45 swears you may have to prod your professors to see if they will take the 414 Chapter 14 Education Text at hand in this case the divine and disturbing Plato to be true. And you will have to be tough if the professor mocks you for uttering a sincere question instead of keeping matters easy for all concerned by staying detached and analytical. Detached analysis has a place, but in the end you've got to speak from the heart and pose the question of truth. You'll be the one who pesters your teachers. You'll ask your history teacher about whether there is a design to our history, whether we're progressing or declining or whether, in the words of a fine recent play, the history boys, history's just one fucking thing after another. You'll be the one who challenges your biology teacher about the intellectual conflict between evolutionist and creationist thinking. You'll not only question the statistics teacher about what numbers can explain but what they can't. Because every subject you study is a language, and since you may adopt 46 one of these languages as your own, you'll want to know how to speak it expertly and also how it fails to deal with those concerns for which it has no adequate words. You'll be looking into the reach of every metaphor that every discipline offers, 
and you'll be trying to see around their corners. The whole business is scary, of course. What if you arrive at college for? Devoted to pre-med, sure that nothing will make you and your family happier than life as a physician, only to discover that elementary school teach. Ing is where your heart is. You might learn that you are not meant to be a doctor at all. Of course, 48. Given your intellect and discipline, you can still probably be one. You can pound your round peg through the very square hole of medical school, then go off into the profession. And society will help you. Society has a cornucopia of resources to encourage you in doing what society needs done but that you don't much like doing and are not cut out to do. To ease your grief, society offers alcohol, television, drugs, divorce, and buying, buying, buying what you don't need. But all those, too, have their costs. Education is about finding out what form of work for you is close to 49 being play work you do so easily that it restores you as you go. Randall Jarrell once said that if he were a rich man, he would pay money to teach poetry to students. I would, too, for what it's worth. In saying that, he, like my father, hinted in the direction of a profound and true theory of learning. Having found what's best for you to do, you may be surprised by how fifty far you rise, how prosperous, even against your own projections, you become. The student who eschews medical school to follow his gift for teaching small children spends his twenties in low-paying but pleasurable and soul-rewarding toil. He's always behind on his student loan payments. He still lives in a house with four other guys, not all of whom got proper instructions on how to clean a bathroom. He buys shirts from the Salvation Army, has intermittent internet, and vacations where he can. But lo he has a gift for teaching. He writes an essay about how to teach, then. A book which no one buys but he writes another in part out of a feeling of injured merit, perhaps and that one they do buy. Edmundson Who are you and what are you doing here? 415 Money is still a problem, but in a new sense. The world wants him to 51 write more, lecture, travel more, and will pay him for his efforts, and he likes this a good deal but he also likes staying around and showing up at school and figuring out how to get this or that little runny-nosed specimen to begin learning how to read. These are the kinds of problems that are worth having, and if you advance, as Thoreau asked us to do, in the general direction of your dreams, you may have them. If you advance in the direction of someone else's dreams if you want to live someone else's dreams rather than yours then get a TV for every room, buy yourself a lifetime supply of your favorite quaff, crank up the porn channel, and groove away. But when we expend our energies in rightful ways, Robert Frost observed, we stay whole and vigorous and we don't get weary. Strongly spent the poet says, is synonymous with kept. 11,111. Reading as a writer, analyzing rhetorical choices. 1. How would you describe Edmundson's ethos, Chapter 9, in this essay? How would you characterize his tone and attitude? Find three passages that you think best illustrate the author's self-representation and discuss how this contributes to or detracts from the argument he makes in this essay. 2. Edmundson names many authors who have shaped his worldview. What do you notice about the writers he lists? Name and discuss some writers who have made a big impact on the way you see the world and don't forget popular authors like J.K. Rowling or John Green. How diverse is your list? 
In what ways did these writers contribute to what Edmundson would call your real education? Writing as a reader, entering the conversation of ideas. 1 Edmundson and Nicole Hannah Jones, pages 434 to 52, critique the educational system from very different perspectives, yet both are concerned with the ways the transformative potential of education is often lost for a variety of reasons. Write an essay in which you examine the concept of education as transformation, taking into consideration these authors' claims about the cultural barriers often blocking students from effective education. What is your evaluation of the author's proposals for change? 2. Consider Mark Edrenunson's claims alongside the ideas raised in the following chapter 4 readings, Stuart Raj A. Staxer's Great Inflation Gone Wild, pages 108-10, and Phil Primux doesn't anybody get a C anymore. Pages 110 to 12. Write an essay in which you draw on these authors' complaints and proposals about an improved educational experience to advance your own argument for a real education that includes evaluation that you believe is fair and useful. 416 Chapter 14. Education. Laura Papineau How Big Time Sports Ate College Life Laura Papineau is an investigative journalist who writes on education and gender equity issues, including the role of sports culture and the university system. Her writing has appeared in the New York Times, the Boston Globe, and the Washington Post, among many other popular newspapers and magazines. The short paragraphing style in this essay is typical of journalistic writing rather than academic writing. However, Papineau demonstrates many other habits of academic writing, such as supporting her argument with a range of evidence from experts and understanding that most issues grow in complexity the more we analyze them. In this essay, Papineau begins with the premise, for good or for ill. Big-time sports has become the public face of the university, the brand that admissions offices sell, a public relations machine thanks to ESPN exposure, para 8. As the essay unfolds, we learn exactly what she means by the phrase for good or for ill. As you read, keep track of the range of evidence Papineau provides to support her claim that the business of college sports has both enhanced universities' profiles, and incomes, and damaged the experience of learning for both student-athletes and student-fans. What statistics and data does she offer, and how persuasive do you find this evidence? Papineau also offers many anecdotes from college life that you may recognize, including tailgating or valuing good stadium seats over classroom insights, para 38. Papineau's depiction of college sports may not be entirely comfortable to read, but that is her point. She asks hard questions that should inspire readers to reconsider the normalization of sports culture in university life. Why does calling yourself a Commodore or a Cornhusker or a Blue Devil, or any other school mascot, matter so much? Why does campus identity so often revolve around sports rather than academic accomplishments? Papineau urges us to question the default setting of sports as the central identity of university life. What would your campus gain, and perhaps lose? If university life revolved around, just imagine, academic learning and achievement. It was a great day to be a Buckeye. Josh Samuels, a junior from Cincin 1 Naughty, dates his decision to attend Ohio State to November 10, 2007, and the chill he felt when the band took the field during a football game against Illinois. I looked over at my brother and I said, TM going here. There is nowhere else I'd rather be. 
even though Illinois won, 28-21. Tim Collins, a junior who is president of Block Zero, the 2,500-member two-student fan organization, understands the rush. It's not something I usually admit to, that I applied to Ohio State 60% for the sports. But the more I do tell that to people, they'll say it's a big reason why they carn. 2. Papineau How Big Time Sports 8 College Life 417 Ohio State boasts 17 members of the American Academy of Arts 3 and Sciences, 3 Nobel laureates, 8 Pulitzer Prize winners, 35 Guggenheim Fellows and a MacArthur winner. But sports rule. It's not, oh, yeah, Ohio State, that wonderful physics department. For its football, said Gordon Obrecht, an Ohio State physics professor. Last month, Ohio State hired Urban Meyer to coach football for $4.5 million a year plus bonuses, playing in the BCS National Championship game nets him an extra $250,000, a graduation rate over 80% would be worth $150,000. He has personal use of a private jet. Dr. Obrecht says he doesn't have enough money in his own budget six to cover attendance at conferences. From a business perspective, he can see why Coach Meyer was hired, but he calls the package just more evidence that the tail is wagging the dog. Dr. Obrecht is not just another cranky tenured professor. Hand seven ringing seems to be universal these days over big-time sports, specifically football and men's basketball. Sounding much like his colleague, James. J. Duderstadt, former president of the University of Michigan and author of Intercollegiate Athletics and the American University, said this. Nine of ten people don't understand what you are saying when you talk about research universities. But you say Michigan and they understand those striped helmets running under the banner. For good or ill, big-time sports has become the public face of the uni University, the brand that admissions offices sell, a public relations machine thanks to ESPN exposure. At the same time, it has not been a good year for college athletics. Child abuse charges against a former Penn State assistant football coach brought down the program's legendary head coach and the university's president. Not long after, allegations of abuse came to light against an assistant basketball coach at Syracuse University. Combine that with the scandals over boosters showering players with cash and perks at Ohio State and, allegedly, the University of Miami and a glaring power gap becomes apparent between the programs and the institutions that house them. There is certainly a national conversation going on now that I can't nine ever recall taking place said William E. Kerwin. Chancellor of the University of Maryland System and CO Director of the Knight Commission on Intercollegiate Athletics. We've reached a point where big-time intercollegiate athletics is undermining the integrity of our institutions, diverting presidents and institutions from their main purpose. The damage to reputation was clear in a November survey by WID-10 Meyer Communications in which 83% of 1,000 respondents blamed the culture of big money in college sports for Penn State officials' failure to report suspected child abuse to local law enforcement, 40% said they would discourage their child from choosing a division. I institution that places a strong emphasis on sports and 72% said Division I sports has too much influence over college life. 418 Chapter 14 Education J. E. F. C. E. 0 Figure 14.1 Games T. U. 
copyright. Has big time sports hijacked the American campus? The word today is 11 balance, and the worry is how to achieve it. The explosion in televised games has spread sports fever well beyond 12. Traditional hotbeds like Alabama and OLE miss classes are cancelled to accommodate broadcast schedules, and new research suggests that fandom can affect academic performance. Campus life itself revolves around not just going to games but lining up and camping out to get into them. It's become so important on the college campus that it's one of the only J3 ways the student body knows how to come together said Alan Sack, president-elect of the Drake Group, a faculty network that lobbies for academic integrity in college sports. In China and other parts of the world, there are no gigantic stadiums in the middle of campus. There is a laser focus on education as being the major thing. In the United States, we play football. Dr. Sack Interim Dean of the University of New Haven's College of Busy 14 Ness, was sipping orange juice at a coffee shop a few blocks from the Yale Bowl. It was a fitting place to meet, given that when the Ivy League was formed in 1954, presidents of the eight-member colleges saw where football was headed and sought to stop it. The pact they made, according to a contemporaneous account in the Harvard Crimson, aimed to ensure that players would enjoy the game as participants in a form of recreational competition rather than as professional performers in public spectacles. There is nothing recreational about Division I football today, points slash underscore, out Dr. Sack, who played for Notre Dame in the 1960s. Since then, athletic. Papineau. How Big Time Sports Ate College Life 419 Departments have kicked the roof off their budgets, looking more like independent franchises than university departments. It is that point this commercial thing in the middle of academia, as 16 Charles T. Claude Felter, a public policy professor at Duke, put it that some believe has thrown the system out of kilter. In his recent book Big Time Sports in American Universities, Dr. Claude Felter notes that between 1985 and 2010, average salaries at public universities rose 32% for full professors, 90% for presidents and 650% for football coaches. The same trend is apparent in a 2010 Knight Commission Report 17 that found the 10 highest spending athletic departments spent a median of $98 million in 2009, compared with $69 million just four years earlier. Spending on high-profile sports grew at double to triple the pace of that. On academics For example, Big Ten colleges, including Penn State, spent a median of $111,620 per athlete on athletics and $18,406 per student on academics. Division I football and basketball, of course, bring in millions of dole 18 lars a year in ticket sales, booster donations, and cable deals. Penn State football is a moneymaker, 2010 Department of Education figures show the team spending $19.5 million and bringing in almost $73 million, which helps support 29 varsity sports. Still, only about half of big-time programs end up in the black, many others have to draw from student fees or the general fund to cover expenses. And the gap between top programs and wannabes is only growing with colleges locked into an arms race to attract the best coaches and build the most luxurious venues in hopes of luring top athletes, and donations from happy alumni. At many Division I big state colleges now, students have pre-game 19 parties, 
when they are pretty much drunk by 10 a.m. on game day, hours before. College sports doesn't just demand more and more money, it is 20 demanding more attention from fans. Glenn R. Waddell, Associate Professor of Economics at the University 21 of Oregon, wanted to know how much. In a study published last month as part of the National Bureau of Education Research Working Paper Series, Oregon researchers compared student grades with the performance of the Fighting Ducks, winner of this year's Rose Bowl and a crowd pleaser in their Nike uniforms in crazy color combinations and mirrored helmets. Here is evidence that suggests that when your football team does 22 well, grades suffer, said Dr. Waddell, who compared transcripts of over 29,700 students from 1999 to 2007 against Oregon's win-loss record. For every three games won, grade point average for men dropped 0.02 widening the GPA gender gap by 9%. Women's grades didn't suffer. In a separate survey of 183 students, the success of the Ducks also seemed to cause slacking off. Students reported studying less, 24% of men, 9% of women, consuming more alcohol, 28%, 20%, and partying more. 47 percent, 28 percent, 420 Chapter 14 Education I 1 ZOJ, C CLCJ U U Dash 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 Copyright Figure 14.2 Kville, This Is Not Occupy Duke its annual tenting outside. Cameron Indoor Stadium for the best seats at a basketball game. While acknowledging a need for more research, Dr. Waddell believes 23 the results should give campus leaders pause, fandom can carry an academic price. No longer can it be the case where we skip right over that. Inconvenience, he said. Dr. Claude Felcher, too, wanted to examine study habits. He tracked articles too. Downloaded from campus libraries during March Madness, the National Collegiate Athletic Association Basketball Tournament. Library patrons at universities with teams in the tournament viewed 6% fewer articles. A day as long as their team was in contention. When a team won an upset or close game, article access fell 19% the day after the victory. Neither dip was made up later with increased downloads. Big time sports, Dr. Claude Felter said, have a real effect on the way 25. People in universities behave. At Duke, one of the country's top universities, Men's basketball sets the 26 rhythms of campus life. Of 600 students who study abroad each year, only 100 do it in the spring. It probably doesn't need to be said, but you don't schedule anything opposite a basketball game. Ever. If there's a basketball game, you don't hold the meeting, you don't hold the event, said Larry Mineta. Vice President for Student Affairs. Then there's the annual campout of 1000 at Crisizos Kivali, the two. Patch of grass named for Coach Mike Krzyzewski outside the hulking Gothic-style gymnasium, to determine the order of the line into the garn. Papano. How Big Time Sports Ate College Life 421 against the rival University of North Carolina, which the Blue Devils host on March 3. Dr. Mineta several years ago stepped into band tents before the first day of classes after winter break, some had started the day after Christmas, but he has mostly let the students own this. 
he was pleased when they decided tenting wouldn't start this year until a week later, January 15. Tenters can sleep indoors when it's below 20 degrees or there is more than 2 inches of accumulated snow. The rest of the time, students must prove their devotion, extra points for game attendance, and their residency, middle-of-the-night tent checks by line monitors signaled by a bullhorn. Even grad students hold their own campout, with 2,200 spending a twos weekend in tents and RVs to enter a lottery for season tickets, only 725 get lucky. It's become such a big deal that a law professor said they have to figure out when that is so as not to invite law firms to campus for interviews that weekend. While Dr. Mineta has concerns about occasional alcohol use and 29 abuse among Kville undergrads, line monitors must intervene if they spot drinking games, he said students manage to camp out for the most part without any negative effect on academics. Oren Starn, a Duke professor who is a longtime critic of its part as I-30 Pation in Division I Athletics, begs to differ. He objects to sports occupying this gigantic place in the university landscape. He calls basketball a strain of anti-intellectualism that claims too much time and attention. But as an anthropologist he teaches anthropology of sports he understands why. It's like going to the Metropolitan Opera or the New York City Ballet, he said. It's a chance to see these incredible athletes and this legendary coach. Dr. Starn put a scholarly spin on it, big-time sports have become a 31 modern tribal religion for college students. There are sacred symbols, team logos, a high priest, Coach K, and shared rituals, chants and face painting. This generation loves pageantry and tradition. School spirit is in right now. Now it's hip to be a joiner and it's hip to be a sports fan. Also, he observed, these kids have grown up with the idea that sports are really a major part of American society and something they should care about. Duke's game against North Carolina is special, but it doesn't take much 32 to provoke a cue for men's basketball. At 8.50 a.m. one day last month, students gathered at Kville. It didn't matter that it was Wednesday, that the game wasn't for 10 hours, that it would rain, even pour, or that Daniel Carp and Matthew Grossman first in line had papers due, Mr. Carp on the religious indoctrination of children, Mr. Grossman about Kant and the boundaries of mere reason. The matchup against Colorado State wasn't even a compelling out of 33 conference game. But the point was not just to be at the game but to be first to enter Cameron Indoor Stadium thereby securing the best seats in the famed student section. 422 Chapter 14 Education Every time they swipe my card and I go in, I get this overwhelming 34 enthusiasm. TM here. It's game time. Mr. Grossman, a freshman from Atlanta, Explained between bites of a burger topped with crumbled blue cheese after the game, blue and white paint still adorning his face. The rise of near professional college sports has fueled the rise of near 35 professional fans. Mr. Carp, a freshman from Philadelphia sporting a number two jersey, said that being a fan was integral to college life. You just learn really early on how to make going to basketball games part of your everyday routine. Kville is legendary, but similar scenes play out at Oklahoma State, 36 Texas A&M, North Carolina State, the University of Missouri, San Diego State and Xavier University, where students line up or camp out for days to get into games.
At the University of Kentucky, they camp out for access to the official start of basketball practice. For a Tuesday night game against Duke in Columbus, for which their 37 were enough seats, according to Mr. Collins, the Block O president, Ohio State students pitched tents along the outside wall of Schottenstein Center starting at 5 p.m. on a Sunday. I can imagine they may have neglected a class or two on Monday and 38 Tuesday, Mr. Collins said. But we are here for four years. What will you remember ten years from now, that you decided to write that English paper? Or you had front row seats at the Duke game? 3. You. A. Shocked, minus zero. J-R-I-E-T. C. Zero. Six. Z. C. C L. Equals Q. Papano. How Big Time Sports 8 College Life 423. Figure 14.3 Studying Students hold their spot for tickets, and even squeeze in some. Worry about students making that sort of academic trade-off led OFFI 39 Chales at Indiana University, Bloomington, to cut short Camp Crean, after coach Tom Crean, last month when students started lining up four days in advance for the Hoosiers basketball game against Kentucky. It's the week before finals, and we didn't want the kids camping out and staying up for days when it's going to be in the 20s and oh, by the way it's finals, said the university spokesman, Mark Land. While only a small number of students had started camping, Mr. Land 40 noted, if you get hundreds out there, it's a party atmosphere. Television has fed the popularity. The more professional big-time college 41 sports has become, the more non-athletes have been drawn in, said Murray Sperber, author of Beer and Circus, how big-time college sports has crippled undergraduate education. Media coverage gets into kids' heads, he said and by the time they are ready to choose a college, it becomes a much bigger factor than it was historically. In the last 10 years, the number of college football and basketball 42 games on ESPN channels rose to 1,320 from 491. This doesn't include games shown by competitors, the Big Ten Network, Fox, CBS slash Turner, versus an NBC. All that programming means big games scheduled during the week and television crews, gridlock, and tailgating on campus during the school day. How can you have a Wednesday night football game without shutting 43 down the university for a day or two? asked Dr. Sack of the Drake Group with a twinge of sarcasm. He's not exactly wrong, though. Last semester, the University of Central Florida cancelled afternoon classes before the televised game against the University of Tulsa. Mississippi State cancelled a day of classes before a Thursday night broadcast of a football game against Louisiana State, creating an online skirmish between Bulldog fans and a blogger who suggested parents should get their tuition back. Even Boston College bowed cancelling afternoon classes because the 44 football game against Florida State was on ESPN at 8 p.m. Janine Hanrahan, a Boston College senior, was so outraged at missing her political science class, immigration, processes, and policies, that she wrote an opinion piece headlined B.C.S. Backwards Priorities in the campus newspaper. It was an indication that football was superseding academics, she explained. We are the national role model, a university spokesman, Jack Dunn, responded. We are the school everyone calls to say, where do you find the balance?
universities make scheduling sacrifices not just for the lucrative Con 45 tracks but also because few visuals build the brand better than an appearance on ESPN's Roadshow College Game Day. In November, it had John. L. Hennessy, president of Stanford, out on the Oval at daybreak working the crowd. The school spirit conveyed by cheering thousands there were 18,000 on Francis Quadrangle at the University of Missouri, Columbia, on 424 Chapter 14 Education October 23, 2010 for game day is a selling point to students choosing colleges. When Missouri first started recruiting in Chicago a decade ago, few prospective students had ever heard the university's nickname, Mizzou, according to the admissions director, Barbara Rupp. Now they know us by Mizzou, thanks in part to game day. I can't deny that, she said. Universities play the sports card, encouraging students to think of 46 themselves as fans. A Vanderbilt admissions blog last fall featured My Vandy Fanatic Weekend describing the thrill of attending a basketball game and football game back-to-back. -back. One of the things we hear in the admissions office is that students these days who are serious about academics are still interested in sports said John Gaines, Director of Undergraduate Admissions. Mr. Gaines slipped in that its academic competitor Washington University in St. Louis is only Division III. We always make sure we throw in a few crowd shots of people wearing black and gold during presentations. Imagine, he is saying, calling yourself a Commodore. Or calling yourself a corn husker. A few years ago, the Big Red WEL 47 come for new University of Nebraska students began including a special treat, the chance to replicate the football team's famed tunnel walk, jogging along the snaking red carpet below Memorial Stadium, then crashing through the double doors onto the field, though without the 86,000 fans. When Kirk Kluver assistant dean for admissions at Nebraska's College 48 of Law, set up his information table at recruiting fairs last year, a student in Minnesota let him know he would check out Nebraska now that you are part of the Big Ten. He got the same reaction in Arizona. Mr. Kluver said applications last fall were up 20%, while law school applications nationally fell 10 percent. Penn State's new president, Rodney Erickson, announced last month 49 that he wanted to lower the football program's profile. How is unclear? A Penn State spokeswoman declined to make anyone available to discuss the future besides releasing a statement from Dr. Erickson about seeking balance. What would balance really look like? Duke officials pride themselves in offering both an excellent education 51 and a stellar sports program. Six years ago this spring, Duke experienced its own national scandal 52. When three lacrosse players were accused of rape by a stripper hired for a party at the lacrosse house a bungalow since torn down. The charges were found to be false, but the episode prompted university leaders to think hard about the relationship between academics and athletics. Kevin M. White, the athletic director, now reports directly to the pre-C-53 dent of Duke. It was part of structural changes to more healthily integrate athletics into university life, said James E. Coleman Jr a law professor who is chairman of the Faculty Athletics Council and was chairman of the committee that investigated the athlete's behavior. Vanderbilt Maiden 50. Papineau How Big Time Sports Ate College Life 425 Even Stronger Move in 2008 
disbanding the athletics department and folding it into the student life division. Sitting in his office on Duke's Durham, N.C., campus, Dr. Coleman set his lunch tray on a mountain of papers and explained the challenges. He calls sports a public square for universities but also acknowledges how rising commercialism comes with strings that have become spider webs. A 2008 report by the Athletics Department, Unrivaled Ambition, A 54 Strategic Plan for Duke Athletics, praises the Kville bonding experience and the identity and cohesion of the rivalry with UNC as it describes in stressful language the facility's arms race, skyrocketing coach salaries and the downside of television deals. We no longer determine at what time we will play our games, because 55 they are scheduled by TV executives, it laments, going on to complain about away games at 9 p.m. students are required to board a flight at 2 a.m., arriving back at their dorms at 4 or 5 a.m., and then are expected to go to class study and otherwise act as if it were a normal school day. And, our amateur student-athletes take the field with a corporate logo displayed on their uniform beside Duke. The key thing is to control the things you can control and make sure 56 the athletic program doesn't trump the rest of the university, as it has in some places, Dr. Coleman said. These presidents have to do more than pay lip service to this notion of balance between athletics and academics. He suggests that elevating academic standards for athletes is one way to assert university not athletic department control over programs. He has also tried to foster rapport between faculty members and the ith 57 athletic department. The difficulty is having faculty understand athletics, he said. Both sides need to cross lines. Otherwise, it becomes these two silos with no connection. Last month, Dr. Coleman hosted a lunch that brought together Mr. White, athletics staff members and professors on his committee. He's also revamping a program to match faculty members with coaches and sends them sports-related articles to bone up on issues. Pointed questions about oversight of its athletic program were raised 58 at Penn State's faculty senate meeting last month, and faculty involvement is the subject of a national meeting of the Coalition on Intercollegiate Athletics at the University of Tulsa this weekend. John S. Nichols the group's CO chairman and professor emeritus at Penn State, says professors typically ignore the many issues that swirl around sports and influence the classroom. His list includes decisions about recruiting and admissions, and even conference realignments. Starting in 2013, the Big East will stretch over seven states, meaning not just football and basketball players but all student-athletes and some fans will be making longer trips to away games. Dr. Nichols says it is time to put some checks in place on uncontrolled growth of athletics or consider a different model. To be sure, efforts to rehabilitate major college sports are not new. 59 aren't much debate an NCAA plan to raise scholarship awards by $2,000. 426 Chapter 14 Education was being reviewed this month. Some have seen it as the athletes do, for the money they bring in, and others as pay for play, some colleges have complained they can't afford it. Many are skeptical that reigning in college sports is even possible, the $60 are simply too attractive, the pressures from outside too great. Mr. White said that it was naive to think we will ever put the toothpaste back in the tube. He added, there is an oversized, insatiable interest in sports, and college sports is part of that. 
but some decisions are in university hands. Despite Duke's ascent to basketball royalty, Cameron Indoor Stadium 62 built in 1940, renovated in the 1980s and at 9,300 seats one of the smallest venues for a big-time program still gives thousands of the best seats. To Students at many large programs, courtside seats and luxury boxes go to boosters. But outsiders with money, Dr. Coleman said, can make demands and change the way the team fits in with a university. We could easily double the size of our basketball stadium and sell it out, he said. That will never happen. If it does, you will know Duke has gone over to the dark side. 61. 222. Reading as a writer, analyzing rhetorical choices. One Papineau includes images to illustrate her claims. Select two to focus on, and use the visual rhetoric insights in Chapter 10 to analyze what these images mean and how they work in the text. How exactly do the images you choose to analyze support specific aspects of Papineau's argument? How might they offer additional or different information as well? 2. Papineau uses descriptive language throughout this essay, and description is never neutral. Find at least five examples of description that enhance her central argument. What conclusions can you draw about how Papain's descriptions enhance her argument? Writing as a reader, entering the conversation of ideas. 1. Papineau and Mark Edmundson, pages 405 to 15, both examine the ways college campus culture can carry more significance for students sometimes than academic study. In an essay that draws on both authors' analyses of the shortcomings of and potential solutions to this campus dynamic, make an argument of your own about the value of these different aspects of college life. 2. Papineau and Naomi Klein, pages 768 to 80 in Economics, are interested in branding and its relationship to our identity and feelings of belonging. Write an essay that places these authors in conversation, using Klein's concept of branding to develop Papineau's claims about sports as a significant branding tool for many campuses. Where do you stand on the value or problems with this development? Support your claims with evidence. Dynarski American schools are more unequal than we thought 427. Susan Dynarski Why American schools are even more unequal than we thought Susan Dynarski is a professor of education, public policy, and economics at the University of Michigan. Because of her experiences as a first-generation college student, she has focused her writing and teaching on education and social justice issues. Her research topics include financial aid and student debt, how charter schools affect communities, and the relationship between college degrees and the job market. Her work reaches beyond the classroom and academic journals so that it can be used to shape policy, she has even shared her research in a testimonial before Congress. This brief but data-packed guest column for the New York Times is a good example of how an expert shapes data for a general audience. Dynarski opens with a clear statement about the effects of poverty on student achievement. In her second paragraph, though, she makes a classic scholarly move, letting us know the situation is more complex than it seems yet the problem is actually much worse than these statistics show. This is a version of the paradoxical introduction described in Chapter 11. The rest of the essay explores the problem of the crude yardstick for economic hardship that has had devastating effects on poor children. As you read, keep track of the variety of evidence Dynarski provides.
Mark the paragraphs in which Dynarski offers quantitative data to support her claim that focusing on disadvantaged students masks the more serious educational challenges for persistently disadvantaged students. How do the numbers she provides help build her case? Make sure you understand how she is using the data, she covers a lot of ground in a small space. Dynarski makes another classic scholarly move in her conclusion when she asks, why does all this matter? She points to a problem that she believes can be solved, but only if we understand the ways the relationship between poverty and academic achievement has been misunderstood. What do you think about her conclusion and what it might mean for persistently disadvantaged children in a community near you or in your home school district? Education is deeply unequal in the United States, with students in poor one districts performing at levels several grades below those of children in richer areas. Yet the problem is actually much worse than these statistics show. Too because schools, districts, and even the federal government have been using a crude yardstick for economic hardship. 428 Chapter 14 Education A closer look reveals that the standard measure of economic dis-3 advantage whether a child is eligible for a free or reduced price lunch in school masks the magnitude of the learning gap between the richest and Poorest children Nearly half of students nationwide are eligible for a subsidized meal for In school Children whose families earn less than 185% of the poverty threshold are eligible for a reduced price lunch, while those below 130% get a free lunch. For a family of four, the cutoffs are $32,000 for a free lunch and $45,000 for a reduced price one. By way of comparison, median household income in the United States was about $54,000 in 2014. Eligibility for subsidized school meals is clearly a blunt indicator of S economic status. But that is the measure that policymakers, educators, and researchers rely on when they gauge gaps in academic achievement in schools, districts, and states. The National Assessment of Educational Progress, often called the Six Nations Report Card, publishes student scores by eligibility for subsidized meals. Under the federal No Child Left Behind Act and its successor, the Every Student Succeeds Act, districts have reported scores separately for disadvantaged children, with eligibility for subsidized meals serving as the standard measure of disadvantage. With Catherine Michelle Moore, a postdoctoral researcher at the Uni 7, University of Michigan, I have analyzed data held by the Michigan Consortium for Educational Research and found that this measure substantially understates the achievement gap. In Michigan, as in the rest of the country, about half of 8th graders 8 in public schools receive a free or reduced price lunch. But when we look more closely ee that just 14% have been eligible for subsidized meals every year since kindergarten. These children are the poorest of the poor the persistently disadvantaged. The math scores of these poorest children are far lower than predicted 9. By the standard measure of economic disadvantage. The achievement gap between persistently disadvantaged children and those who were never disadvantaged is about a third larger than the gap that is typically measured. Education researchers often express test score differences in standard JO deviations, which allows for a consistent measure of gaps across different tests, populations, and contexts. Measured using that conventional approach, the gap in math scores between disadvantaged 8th graders and their classmates in Michigan is 0.69 standard deviations. 
This places disadvantaged children roughly two grades behind their classmates. By contrast, the gap based on persistent disadvantage is much wider, 0.94 standard deviations, or nearly three grades of learning. In fact, there is a nearly linear, negative relationship between the NERN 11 BER of years of economic disadvantage and math scores in 8th grade. These lower scores do not appear to be caused by more years of disadvantage, however. When we look at 3rd grade scores, nearly all of the Dynarski American schools are more unequal than we thought 429. Eighth grade score deficit is already in place. By third grade, those children who will end up spending all of primary school eligible for subsidized meals have already fallen far behind their classmates. What is the explanation? It appears that years spent eligible for sub C12 dized school meals serves as a good proxy for the depth of disadvantage. When we look back on the early childhood of persistently disadvantaged 8th graders, we see that by kindergarten they were already far poorer than their classmates. We can see this with national data. The Early Childhood Longitudinal 13 study, run by the Department of Education, tracks a sample of children who started kindergarten in 1998. Among children who were eligible for subsidized meals through 8th grade, household income during kindergarten was just $20,000. For those who were only occasionally eligible, it was closer to $47,000, and for those never eligible, $80,000. These data also show that persistently disadvantaged children are far 14 less likely than other students to live with two parents or have a college-educated mother or father. Just 2% of persistently disadvantaged children have a parent with a college degree, compared with 24% of the occasionally disadvantaged, and 57% of those who were never disadvantaged. No one ever actively decided that eligibility for subsidized meals was one south the best way to measure students' economic disadvantage. The metric was widely available and became by default the standard way to distinguish between poorer and richer children. But it was always an imprecise measure, and we can do better at little cost. Many states now use administrative data on eligibility for means 16 tested programs such as welfare benefits and food stamps to automatically qualify children for subsidized meals in school. Since these programs have a range of income cutoffs, their eligibility flags can be used to distinguish between children who are extremely poor and those who are nearly middle class. The children whose families persistently receive benefits will be the neediest of all. Why does all this matter? Many federal, state, and local programs disentribute money based on the share of a district's students who are eligible for subsidized meals. But schools that have identical shares of students eligible for subsidized meals may differ vastly in the share of students who are deeply poor. The schools with the most disadvantaged children have greater challenges and arguably need more resources. Reading as a writer, analyzing rhetorical choices 1. A key to understanding Dynarski's point is the distinction she makes between disadvantaged and persistently disadvantaged students. Find her definitions in the text, and then explain them in your own words. 430 Chapter 14 Education 2. In paragraph 6, Dynarski mentions both the Federal No Child Left Behind Act and the Every Student Succeeds Act. Look these laws up and discuss their significance, as well as the problem Dynarski sees in their implement. Tashin Writing as a reader, entering the conversation of ideas. 
One Dynarski shares an interest in income inequality and the impact on education with the co-authors Sean F. Reardon, Jane Waldfogel, and Daphna Basak, pages 430-34. These two essays take very different approaches to the problem, however. In an essay of your own, place these texts in conversation, comparing and evaluating the ways the authors provide claims, data, and conclusions. What conclusions can you draw, based on the material in these brief texts, about the challenges ahead for a more equi table public education system? 2. Dynarski examines pre-college educational inequalities and economics that provide the groundwork for the claims Sarah Goldrick Rabb pages 742-49 in Economics, makes about the crisis in paying for college. Write an essay that connects these essays, using the claims and evidence each author provides to make an argument of your own about the long-term impact of income inequality on access to education and the significance of this impact. What changes do you propose? What will happen if nothing changes? What might happen if changes you propose are implemented? Sean F. Reardon, Jane Waldfogel, and Daphna Basak The Good News About Educational Inequality Sean Reardon and Daphna Basak are professors of education, Jane Waldfogel is a social work professor. You will hear their two areas of expertise in this New York Times guest column, which like the essay by Susan Dynarski, examines the evidence of educational gaps between wealthy and poor children. They begin by acknowledging the drumbeat of bad news about inequality in education. Right away in paragraph 2, however, they cite evidence for good news and launch their case with support that there is reason to be optimistic about at least one data point the narrowing gap in readiness for school between poor and wealthy students and also between racial groups. In paragraph 4, they offer the key evidence, be sure you understand what those numbers mean. Starting in paragraph 7, the authors puzzle through possible inter predations and reasons for the data, which come not just from education reform but from changes in social services and literacy campaigns. Pay attention to the ways the authors weigh one interpretation in paragraph 7 and then challenge the interpretation in the next paragraph. Here, we are seeing the minds of scholars at work as they resist simple conclusions. Reardon, Waldfogel, and Basak Educational Inequality 431 And instead seek to appreciate the complexity of measuring human experiences, given the myriad social contexts and dynamics that affect children's preparation for school. You may be surprised by their suggestion that changing scientific and cultural attitudes toward early childhood brain development may be one explanation for the narrowed gap between wealthy and poor children. How and why is this the case? What kinds of social programs might be credited with fostering more good night moon time, para 10, for poor children? Despite the optimistic frame of this essay, the writer's final three paragraphs assert the limits of their claims. Reread these concluding paragraphs and make note of all the social, economic, and educational changes they believe are necessary for poor children to thrive. Do they leave you with hope or something less than that? What do you think the writers want their readers to do with this information? When inequality is the topic, it can seem as if all the news is bad. Income inequality continues to rise. Economic segregation is growing. Racial gaps in education, employment, and health endure. Our society is not particularly fair. But here is some good news about educational inequality, the inner two mouse gap in academic performance between high and low-income children has begun to narrow. 
Children entering kindergarten today are more equally prepared than they were in the late 1990s. We know this from information collected over the last two decades three, by the National Center for Education Statistics. In the fall of 1998 and again in 2010, the NCES sent early childhood assessors to roughly 1,000 public and private kindergartens across the United States. They sat down one-on-one -on -one with 15 to 25 children in each school to measure their reading and math skills. They asked children to identify shapes and colors, to count, to identify letters and to sound out words. They also surveyed parents to learn about the children's experiences before entering kindergarten. Working with the social scientist Jimena Portilla, we used this data for, to track changes over time Indiana school readiness gaps the differences in academic skills between low-income and high-income children entering kindergarten. What we found is surprising. From 1998 to 2010, the school readiness gap narrowed by 10% in math and 16% in reading. The gaps that remain are still vast. But even this modest improvement represents a sharp reversal of the trend over the preceding decades. It's worth noting that the gap in school readiness narrowed because five of relatively rapid improvements Indiana the skills of low-income children, not because the skills of children from high-income families declined. Research one of us did with Scott Latham at the University of Virginia. 432 Chapter 14 Education Showed that both poor and affluent children entered kindergarten in 2010 with stronger reading and math skills than they did in the late 1990s. School readiness gaps between racial groups have also improved, both the white-black and white-Hispanic gaps narrowed by roughly 15% from 1998 to 2010. These improvements appear to persist at least into fourth grade. Data 6 From the National Assessment of Educational Progress show that by 2015, when those kindergartners were in fourth grade, their math and reading skills were roughly two-thirds of a grade level higher than those of their counterparts 12 years earlier. This was true for children of all racial and ethnic groups and for poor and non-poor children alike. What's behind these surprising developments? One possibility is seven that school readiness gaps have narrowed because it is easier now for poor families to find high-quality, publicly funded preschool programs for their children. Today 29% of four-year-olds are enrolled in state-funded preschools, up from 14% in 2002. Greater availability of affordable preschool programs particularly if they are high quality may be part of the reason poor children are starting to catch up to their affluent peers. It is unlikely, however, that preschool enrollment is the primary expl-s. Nation Although more poor children today attend preschool than in the 1990s, enrollment rates dipped in 2010 perhaps because of rising unemployment after the Great Recession. And while the quality of the typical preschool program may have improved, as recently as 2004 most poor children attended public preschools that were far inferior to those available in affluent communities. It may be changes in children's homes that have mattered most. Track 9 in the experiences of young children over time, we found that both rich and poor children today have more books and read with their parents more often than they did in the 90s. They are far more likely to have computers, internet access, and computer games focused on reading and math skills. Their parents are more likely to spend time with them, taking them to the library or doing activities at home. The children of the rich have always had more of these opportunity ties than poor children. 
What has changed is that low-income children are now getting more of what the political scientist Robert Putnam calls good night moon time than they did in the 1990s. That's excellent news. But here's the puzzle, in many ways, the lives of rich and poor parents g haven't become more equal far from it. Among families with school-age children, income inequality grew by roughly 10% from 1998 to 2010, economic segregation grew by 20%. How is it that the school readiness gap is nonetheless narrowing? We suspect that in part this happened because of the widespread diffuse J. Zion of a single powerful idea, that the first few years of a child's life are the most consequential for cognitive development. This idea is commonplace today, but it wasn't always. Less than a century ago, the historian Julia Reardon, Waldfogel, and Basak. Educational Inequality 433 Wrigley Notes Mainstream magazines routinely advised new mothers that intellectual stimulation of babies was harmful. Now we know better, the result of decades of scientific research about 13 brain development, poverty and the long-term effects of high-quality preschool programs. But low-income families haven't always had the same information about the unique importance of early childhood. Indeed, part of why the achievement gap grew in the 1980s and 1990s was that rich families rapidly increased their investment of both time and money in their children's cognitive development. Why are low-income families now adopting these parenting practices? It may 14th be partly a result of public information campaigns like Reach Out and Red, the Too Small to Fail initiative and local efforts in cities like Providence, R.I., which aim to teach parents simple ways to help their children build the vocabulary and cognitive skills that form a foundation for success in school. In conjunction with public investments in home visiting programs once and high-quality preschool programs, these campaigns represent an effort to ensure that our knowledge about the unique importance of early childhood helps everyone like a new medical innovation that is first adopted by the wealthy but then becomes commonplace, the emphasis on public and private investments in young children has helped turn a benefit for the rich into an equalizing force in society. As encouraging as this new evidence is, we have a long way to go. Poor 16 children still enter kindergarten nearly a year behind their richer peers. Even if school readiness gaps continue to narrow at the rate they did between 1998 and 2010, it would take another 60 to 110 years for them to be completely eliminated. Changes in parenting are not going to be sufficient to sustain or speed 17 this progress, although more paid leave would help. Economic inequal ITY still constrains poor children's horizons. Low-income and middle-class parents still struggle to find affordable, high-quality preschools. The elementary, middle, and high schools that rich and poor students attend differ markedly in resources and quality. And it isn't clear that the recent reductions in school readiness gaps will automatically translate into greater equality in high school, college, and beyond. If we don't do something about these larger problems, the progress 18 we have made toward equality in early childhood may prove only a brief respite from ever-widening educational inequality. Good night Moon, 4. All its charm and power is no substitute for comprehensive social policy. Reading as a writer, analyzing rhetorical choices. One these three writers come from two different disciplinary backgrounds, education and social work. Reread the essay, and mark in two different colors the portions of the essay that seem drawn from educational research. 
434 Chapter 14 Education and insights and those from Social Work Insights. Discuss the rationale for your markings in pairs, small groups, or as a class. If it is difficult to tell which discipline some of their ideas come from, discuss the significance of this observation. To these writers mention a few literacy programs in paragraph 14, which they credit with changing parenting patterns and enhancing many low-income children's readiness for school. Do an internet search for literacy programs in your county. Does the language seem to be pitched to a particular population? Discuss your findings in the context of this essay. Writing as a reader, entering the conversation of ideas. One this essay is directly in conversation with Susan Dynarski's essay in this chapter, pages 427 to 29. Write an essay of your own in which you evaluate the claims, evidence, and conclusions in both readings. You might focus on the students' ages in each piece, how the authors define poverty, and the significance you see in their findings. Where is their common ground and contrasting information? What conclusions can you draw? Two Reardon, Wald Fogel, and Basak are interested in the shifting culture around early childhood education and the longer-term effects this might have on student learning. Carol Dweck, pages 594 to 604 in Psychology and Biology shares an interest in the effect of shifting attitudes and our understanding of human potential. Write an essay that uses information and claims in both readings to make an argument about the significance of cultural attitudes to learning. You should take into consideration the economic inequalities Reardon, Waldfogel, and Basak include in their essay as you build your own argument. Nicole Hannah-Jones School Segregation, The Continuing Tragedy of Ferguson Nicole Hannah-Jones is an award-winning writer whose reporting has been featured in ProPublica, The New York Times, and on NPR and Face the Nation, among other news sources. She also helped found the Ida B. Wells Society for Investigative Reporting which offers mentorship aimed at increasing the number of investigative reporters of color. In this ProPublica essay that also ran in the New York Times magazine, Hannah Jones draws on the circumstances of Michael Brown's life and his tragic shooting death to illustrate the profound educational inequality in his community. His untimely death, she argues, reveals a more subtle, ongoing racial injustice, the vast disparity in resources and expectations for black children in America's stubbornly segregated educational system, PARA 9. Hannah Jones School Segregation 435 Hannah Jones writes in a short paragraph form favored by journalists, as do some of the other writers in this chapter. She also employs many academic rhetorical techniques. For example, you might consider the effect of her narrative introduction, see advice about drafting introductions in Chapter 11, which places readers at Michael Brown's graduation ceremony, only eight days before he was shot by a police officer. The essay's central concern is less the specific experiences of Michael Brown's life and death, however, than it is the profound differences between the Normandy School District where Brown attended the lowest-ranked school system in Missouri and the wealthy, predominantly white Clayton District five miles away ranked in the top 10 percent. Hannah Jones reveals that this is not an inevitable inequality. In paragraphs 16 and 17, she points out that Michael Brown's mother, who grew up in the same town, had a far better education than her son did due to desegregating policies that were eventually dismantled. Hannah Jones offers additional historical context in the section titled Dred Scott, Desegregation, and a Dearth of Progress. 
the story of all the political decisions that led to the Normandy School District being ranked at the bottom of Missouri's schools by the time Michael Brown enrolled in 2013 is the core of this essay. Hannah Jones illustrates her argument about the ways the educational deck is stacked against black students in the Normandy School District with another family's thwarted attempts to improve access to better education for children, in the section titled Fears, Flight, and a Suddenly Black Suburb Left to Crumble. She also offers two charts of data comparing many aspects of education in Clayton, the nearby wealthy district, and Normandy. In addition, she provides a map of racial percentages in the area. Spend some time with this data, and be ready to explain how they enhance Hannah Jones's argument. In the final section, Little Hope and a Telling Burial, Hannah Jones answers the question every academic writer should be able to answer. So what? Her response? Students who spend their careers in segregated schools can look forward to a life on the margins, according to a 2014 study. They are more likely to be poor. They are more likely to go to jail. They are less likely to graduate from high school, to go to college, and to finish if they go. They are more likely to live in segregated neighborhoods as adults. Para 116. In other words, educational inequality can inflict generations of damage. Hannah Jones provides the tragic proof. On August 1, five black students in satiny green and red robes and one mortar boards waited inside an elementary school classroom, listening for their names to be called as graduates of Normandy High School. The ceremony was held months after the school's main graduation for students who had been short of credits or had opted not to participate earlier. One of those graduating that day was Michael Brown. He was 18, his two mothers' oldest son. He was headed to college in the fall. 436 Chapter 14 Education Shocked CI 2 IL colon U C5 3 Q 8 days later Brown was dead killed in the streets of nearby Fur 3 Gasson MO by a white police officer in a shooting that ignited angry protests and another round of painful national debate about race policing and the often elusive matter of justice. News reports in the days and weeks after Brown's death often noted his recent graduation and college ambitions, the clear implication that the teen's school achievements only deepened the sorrow over his loss. But if Brown's educational experience was a success story, it was a five-damning one. The Normandy School District from which Brown graduated is among six the poorest and most segregated in Missouri. It ranks last in overall academic performance. Its rating on an annual state assessment was so dismal that by the time Brown graduated the district had lost its accreditation. About half of black male students at Normandy High never graduate. Seven just one in four graduates enters a four-year college. The college where Brown was headed is a troubled for-profit trade school that a U.S. Senate report said targeted students for their vulnerabilities, and that at one time advertised itself to what it internally called the area's unemployed, underpaid, unsatisfied, unskilled, unprepared, unsupported, unmotivated, unhappy underserved. A mere five miles down the road from Normandy is the wealthy County 8 seat where a grand jury recently decided not to indict Darren Wilson, the officer who killed Brown. Success there looks drastically different. The Clayton public schools are predominantly white, with almost no poverty to speak of. The district is regularly ranked among the top 10% in Q. 13. 
J. I. End colon. Hannah Jones. School Segregation 437. Dash. Dot S. E. J. U. C. J. Dot C. 3. Copyright. Figure 14.4 Normandy High School Principal Derek Mitchell has been tasked with turning around a high school where most students read, write, and do math below grade level. The state. More than 96% of students graduate. Fully 84% of graduates head to four-year universities. Brown's tragedy, then, is not limited to his individual potential cut through nine tally short. His schooling also reveals a more subtle, ongoing racial injustice, the vast disparity in resources and expectations for black children in America's stubbornly segregated educational system. As ProPublica has documented in a series of stories on the resegregation of America's schools, Hundreds of school districts across the nation have been released from court-enforced integration over the past 15 years. Over that same time period, the number of so-called apartheid schools schools whose white population is 1% or less has shot up. The achievement gap, greatly narrowed during the height of school desegregation, has widened. American schools are disturbingly racially segregated, period, Kath 11 Irene Laman, head of the U.S. Education Department's Civil Rights Office, said in an October speech. We are reserving our expectations for our highest rigor level of courses, the courses we know our kids need to be able to be full and productive members of society, but we are reserving them for a class of kids who are white and who are wealthier. According to data compiled by the Education Department, black and 12 Latino children are the least likely to be taught by a qualified, experienced teacher, to get access to courses such as chemistry and calculus, and to have access to technology. 438 Chapter 14 the inequalities along racial lines are so profound nationally that in Octo, 13 Burr the department's Office for Civil Rights issued a 37-page letter to school district superintendents warning that the disparities may be unconstitutional. What proficiency looks like in Clayton and Normandy? 84.4% 88.0% Ninety four point seven per cent, eleven point zero per cent. Algebra I Education four point zero per cent. Biology I thirty three point eight per cent. English two eighty one point six per cent, twelve point four per cent. Government White Clayton students, Black Clayton students, Black Normandy students, Missouri tracks students' progress toward the state's achievement goals through end of course assessment tests. End of course assessments are grouped by subject, not grade level. This graphic shows the percentage of students by race and district who scored as proficient or advanced in each subject. Scores were not available for white Normandy students as there were less than 30 students who took the test. Data from Missouri Department of Elementary and Secondary Education Few places better reflect the rise and fall of attempts to integrate U.S. 14 schools than St. Louis and its suburbs. Decades of public and private housing discrimination made St. Louis 15 one of the most racially segregated metropolitan areas in the country. Out of that grew a network of school district boundaries that to this day have divided large numbers of black students in racially separate schools as effectively as any Jim Crow law. In 1983, 
under federal court order, St. Louis and some of its suburbs 16 embarked on what would become the grandest and most successful inter-district school desegregation program in the land, one that, at least for a time, broke the grim grip of zip codes for tens of thousands of black students. As an elementary school student, under this order, Michael Brown's mother rode the bus from St. Louis to affluent Ladue. But like so many other desegregation efforts across the country, the 17 St. Louis plan proved short-lived, largely abandoned after several years by politicians and others who complained that it was too costly. Jay Nixon, Missouri's current governor, whose response to Brown's killing has come under intense scrutiny in recent months, helped lead the effort that brought the court order to a close. Since their retreat from desegregation initiatives, many St. Louis 18 county schools have returned to the world of separate and unequal that existed before the U.S. Supreme Court's landmark decision in Brown v. Board of Education School Segregation 439 It could be said that the Normandy School District, where Michael 19 Brown spent the last year and a half of high school, never left. Excluded from the court-ordered integration plan that transformed other school systems in the St. Louis area, Normandy's fiscally and academically disadvantaged schools have essentially been in free fall since the 1980s. Throughout the region, the educational divide between black Shiel 20 Dren and white children is stark. In St. Louis County, 44% of black children attend schools in districts the state says perform so poorly that it has stripped them of full accreditation. Just 4% of white students do. Yet state education officials say there is little political will to change 21 that. Hannah Jones Instead, they have promised to work to make segregated school dis 22 tricks equal, the very doctrine the Supreme Court struck down in the Brown decision. We are failing to properly educate the black child, said Michael Jones. 23 Vice President of the Missouri State Board of Education. Individually, any one person can overcome anything. But we've got masses of children with bad starts in life. They can't win. We ought to be ashamed of that. Since August 9, the day Michael Brown's lifeless body lay for hours under 24 a hot summer sun, St. Louis County has become synonymous with the country's racial fault lines when it comes to police conduct and the criminalization of black youth. But most black youth will not die at the hands of police. They will face the future that Brown would have faced if he had lived. 25 that is, to have the outcome of their lives deeply circumscribed by what they learn and experience in their segregated, inferior schools. Dred Scott, desegregation and a dearth of progress. Missouri is what the locals like to call a southern state with northern 26 exposure. It entered the Union through a compromise that determined how much of the country would permit slavery and wound up a slave state surrounded on three sides by free states. It was in a St. Louis case in 1857 that the U.S. Supreme Court handed 27 down one of its most infamous opinions. The court, in ruling against the enslaved Dred Scott, affirmed that black people were not citizens and had no rights that the white man was bound to respect. The spirit of the ruling reverberated for generations in St. Louis. 28 which in the years after the Civil War became the destination for large numbers of former slaves. Indeed, the Mississippi River town became a national leader in how to contain what white real estate agents called the Negro Invasion. 440 Chapter 14 Education In 1916, 
after a successful campaign that included placards urging, 29 Save Your Home. Vote for segregation, the city's residents passed a measure requiring that black and white residents live on separate, designated blocks. In doing so, St. Louis became the first city in the country to require housing segregation by popular ballot. The tactic eventually fell to a legal challenge, but white residents found other ways to keep themselves, and their schools, protected from black residents. One way was to write segregation into the sales contracts of houses. 30 The clauses, known as real estate covenants, ensured the whiteness of neighborhoods by barring the sale of homes to black home buyers ever, and across entire sectors of the city. These practices quickly created a clear dividing line in St. Louis that endures to this day, black people north of Del Mar Boulevard, white people south. In 1948, another landmark St. Louis case led to the U.S. Supreme 3J Court striking down the enforcement of real estate covenants anywhere in the country. The case involved a black resident named J.D. Shelley, who bought a home with a deed restriction and then was sued by a white homeowner, Louis Kramer, trying to block him from moving into the subdivision. With legal discrimination under attack in the courts, white residents 32 began abandoning St. Louis altogether. From 1950 to 1970, the city lost. R.O. O. Point zero. Six. Two. Figure 14.5 SCOML pots, concrete sewer pipes filled with dirt named for former St. Louis Mayor Vincent SCOML. These barricades, ubiquitous in St. Louis, block off the heavily white neighborhoods along Del Mar Boulevard, the city's infamous racial dividing line. Hannah Jones School Segregation 441 Nearly 60% of its white population This white flight was partly underwritten by the federal government, which secured loans reserved only for white home buyers. Town after town sprung up along the northern edge of St. Louis, some 33 no larger than a single subdivision. Immediately, Many forbade rentals and required homes to be built on large, more expensive lots. These devices helped keep neighborhoods white because black residents tended to be poorer and had difficulty getting home loans after decades of workplace, lending and housing discrimination. Even today, 77% of white St. Louis area residents own their homes compared to 45% of black residents, the U.S. Census shows. Some of the tactics employed by St. Louis suburbs, including zoning, 34 also were knocked down by courts. But court victories, in the end, mattered little. A century of white effort 35 had lastingly edged the county map, a struggling, heavily black urban core surrounded by a constellation of 90 segregated little towns. St. Louis yielded some of the starkest racial dividing lines in any 36 American city, north or south, said Colin Gordon, a University of Iowa professor who traces this history in his book Mapping Decline. St. Louis and the Fate of the American City I like to think of St. Louis not as an outlier, but one in which all the things we're talking about are just more visible. A segregation success, quickly abandoned. One legal fight breached at least temporarily the St. Louis area's stark 37 boundaries of home and property, and with them the 24 segregated school districts covering those 90 segregated little towns. In 1954, the year of the Brown v. Board of Education Supreme Court 38 decision, St. Louis ran the second-largest segregated school district in the country. In the face of the ruling, 
school officials promised to integrate voluntarily. But they redrew school district lines around distinctly black and white neighborhoods to preserve their segregated schools. Even so, many white families still left, avoiding the chance of integration by simply moving across municipal lines. By 1980, 90% of black children in St. Louis still attended predominantly black schools. With few white students left, it was clear that a desegregation plan 40 that did not include the white suburbs would be futile. In 1981, a federal judge called for a plan to bus black St. Louis children to white suburban schools. White suburban residents, and their school leaders, revolted. They filed 41 motions in court and penned angry letters to the local newspaper. The judge, William Hungate, responded by threatening to do the one thing they. 442. Chapter 14. Education. Figure 14.6 Junior Christopher Higgins, right, works at the chalkboard with other Normandy High School students. Research shows students of all races and incomes do worse in segregated schools. 0. L. 2. 5. U. S. C. 3. At. White suburbs feared more than the busing plan, dissolve the carefully constructed school district boundaries and merge all 24 of the discrete districts into a single metro-wide one. The opposition to the plan to bus children out of St. Louis collapsed. In 1983, St. Louis and its suburbs enacted the largest and most expensive inter-district school desegregation program in the country. At its peak, some 15,000 St. Louis public school students a year went to school in 16 heavily white suburban districts. Another 1,300 white students headed the opposite direction to new, integrated magnet schools in St. Louis. The program had its flaws chief among them, that it left another 15,000 of St. Louis's black students in segregated, inferior schools. And the transition of black urban students into white suburban schools was not always smooth. But for the transfer students who rode buses out of the city, the Plan 45 successfully broke the deeply entrenched connection between race, zip code, and opportunity. Test scores for 8th and 10th grade transfer students rose. The transfer students were more likely to graduate and go on to college. In surveys, White students overwhelmingly said they'd benefited from minus 16. The opportunity to be educated alongside black students. In short order, St. Louis's was heralded by researchers and educators as the nation's most successful metro-wide desegregation program. Hannah Jones School Segregation 443 But from the moment it started, the St. Louis effort was under assault. 47 It was never popular among the area's white residents. Politicians, Republicans, and Democrats alike, vowed to end the program. Then State Attorney General John Ashcroft tried first, appealing ST 48 Lewis School desegregation case all the way to the Supreme Court. He was succeeded by Jay Nixon a Democrat who matched Ashcroft's fervor in seeking to end the program. Nixon came from a rural area. His position on school desegregation was 49 more of a Southern Democrat, and it came pretty close to massive resistance, said William Freevogel, director of Southern Illinois University's School of Journalism, who covered the Supreme Court for the St. Louis Post-Dispatch. 1. Jennings 98.8% black students 2. Riverview 97.8% black students 
3 Normandy 915% black students 4 University City 83.5% black students 5 St. Louis City 82.7% black students 10 Maplewood Richmond 19 Bayless 30.8% black students 13.5% black students 11 Brentwood 20 Melville 25.7% black students 9.7% black students 12 Valley Park 21 Rockwood 23.2% black students 9.4% black students 13 Clayton 22 Afton 18.8% black students 7% black students 14 Webster Groves 23 Lindbergh 17.9% black students 4.1% black students 6 Ferguson Florissant 15 Hancock Place 79.9% black students 17.2% black students 7 Hazelwood 16 Ladue 72.9% black students 16 7% black students 8 Rittenour 17 Kirkwood 39.8% black students 15.9% black students 9 Pattonville 18 Parkway 33.1% black students 15.2% black students 42 I7718 R6W 431D 30% I5 D30 to 60% D60 to 90%, 1CH 90% II21, 44. Figure 14.7 Concentration of Black Students in St. Louis County School Districts, St. Louis County is etched into 24 racially distinct school districts, with heavily black schools, indicated in blue, clustered in the city of St. Louis and its northern suburbs and heavily white schools to the west and south. Data from Missouri Department of Elementary and Secondary Education 444 Chapter 14 Education During the 1980s and early 1990s, I once wrote that Nixon behaved like a southern politician standing in the schoolhouse door. Nixon never expressly opposed the idea of integration. His arguments so centered on what he considered the astronomical costs of the desegregation plan. The price tag, initially in the hundreds of millions of dollars, would reach $1.7 billion. Nixon, who would not be interviewed for this article, launched a number SJ. Burr of legal challenges and prevailed in 1999 when supporters of the desegregation plan ultimately agreed to make the program voluntary. Nixon had successfully challenged Kansas City's desegregation plan before the U.S. Supreme Court, and some feared he would be similarly successful if the St. Louis case came before the court. Districts soon began to drop out of the program and the number of Stu 52. Dents participating steadily dwindled. Today, the voluntary program remains in place, still the largest of just eight inter-district desegregation programs in the country. But it is a shadow of what it once was. Some 4,800 students get to escape the troubles of the St. Louis public schools, but each year, the program receives seven times as many applicants as open spaces. Amy Stewart Wells is a Columbia's Teachers College professor who CO53 authored a book, Stepping Over the Color Line, 
African American students in white suburban schools, on the impact of the St. Louis plan on transfer students. I don't think many people realized how far ahead St. Louis really 54 was, she said. There are hundreds of thousands of people in the St. Louis metro area who were affected by this plan, but, the suburbs, did it because they had to and nobody said, look, we're a national model for our country. There were seeds sown that could have been so much more. This was the epicenter of where people tried to grapple with race, and 55. Failed miserably. Fears, flight and a suddenly black suburb left to crumble. The white flight out of St. Louis left behind a trail of decay, as it did in many 56 large northern cities. City services lapsed when more affluent residents left. Businesses and jobs migrated as well. The schools in particular suffered. Not surprisingly, black residents who could afford it looked for a way 57 out, too. They looked to older North St. Louis suburbs, including Normandy. Incorporated in 1945 and covering fewer than two square miles, Normandy became a destination for the city's fleeing white working class. Nedra Martin's family was among the black strivers who began to 58 make their way to Normandy. Martin, who lives in Normandy today and works for Walmart, said her parents first came to the town in 1975. They both worked government jobs her dad was a welder for the city, her mom an aide in a state group home. Hannah Jones School Segregation 445 E C P E P 2 3 U, comma, point 5 C 3. Copyright. Figure 14.8 Nedra Martin sued the state. Martin said she did it not just for her own child, but for the parents who are defeated, who feel the same way I feel that they don't care about our children's education. My parents raised us to know that we are as good as anybody else, 59 Martin said. But as black families like the Martins moved in, for sale signs went 60 up. White families started moving out, often to emerging outposts even farther from the heart of St. Louis. After 1970, black enrollment in the Normandy schools exploded, more 61 than doubling within eight years to 6,200. By 1978, only St. Louis enrolled more black students than Normandy. Yet Normandy was left out of the metro-wide desegregation order that 62 produced those few years of brighter outcomes for black students between 1983 and 1999. The order kept black enrollment at suburban districts. At 25%, and Normandy and six other North St. Louis suburbs were already too black. Instead, the Normandy schools buckled under their swift demographic 63 shift, beginning a steep decline. Many of the best teachers followed the white and middle class exodus. Instruction fell off. The district suffered from a revolving door of leadership, with principals and superintendents seldom sticking around more than a couple of years. Unable to meet minimum requirements for student achievement, the district clung to provisional accreditation for 15 years. But black families had less freedom to simply move away to bet 64 ter school districts than even their poorer white neighbors. Housing 446 Chapter 14 Education Hannah Jones School Segregation 44-7 Discrimination continues to keep black families out of communities with quality schools, 
according to a 2013 St. Louis housing study. The most affluent black families in Normandy, then, often opted out 65 of the local school system, paying to send their children to private school. As a result, Normandy's schools ended up considerably poorer and more racially segregated than the communities they serve. For years, the Normandy school system walked an academic tight 66 rope. Then, in 2009, the state made matters worse. New Education Commissioner Chris Nicastro decided that it was time 67 to move on segregated districts that consistently failed their students. The state shuttered Wellston, a desperately poor, 500-student district next to Normandy that held the distinction of being Missouri's only 100% black school system. One state official had called conditions in Wellston's schools Dipler 68 able and academically abusive. The issue for state officials was what to do next with Wellston's students. 69 One thing was clear, the students were not going to be absorbed into any 70 of the high-performing, mostly white districts nearby. Jones, the State Board of Education official, was blunt about why, you'd have had a civil war. The difference between Clayton and Normandy. Five miles separate the Clayton and Normandy school districts, but much more sets them apart. Here are some characteristics of the two districts from the 2013 to 2014 school year. Clayton. Normandy. Accreditation status. Accredited. Unaccredited. Four-year graduation rate, white students. 96.3%. Too few students to accurately determine. Four-year graduation rate, black students. 93.8%. 61.4%. Average teacher salary. $71,205 $59,560 Average spending per pupil $17,851 $15,096 Percentage of high school core classes not taught by highly qualified teachers 1.0% 39.7% Composite Act Score, National Average, 21 25.7 16 Source, Missouri Department of Elementary and Secondary Education It was all corrupt politics. By the time Michael Brown reached his junior year in high school, he had 74 bounced between local districts and spent most of his career in racially segregated and economically disadvantaged schools. Behind in credits, he enrolled at Normandy High in the spring of 2013. If he had dreams of academic success, he could not have wound up in 75 a more challenging place to realize them. The state's 2014 assessment report on Normandy's schools was spec 76 tacularly bleak, zero points awarded for academic achievement in English, zero for math, for social studies, for science, zero for students headed to college, zero for attendance, zero for the percent of students who graduate. Its total score, 10 out of 140. Out of 520 districts in the state, Normandy, where 98% of Stu 77 dents are black and 9 of 10 were poor in 2013, is marooned at the very bottom. Decades of research show that segregated, high poverty schools are 78 simply toxic for students of all races and backgrounds. Just last month, 
the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill released a study showing that black first graders in segregated schools performed worse than black students with the same backgrounds, meaning poverty, parental education, and other factors, who attend integrated schools. Officials then turned to Normandy, which already enrolled almost 5,000 students. Merging two impoverished, struggling systems made sense to almost no one, especially the officials in charge of Normandy's schools. The state went forward with it anyway. If you are strictly doing what's best for all kids, you don't merge those two districts, Stanton Lawrence, Normandy's superintendent at the time, said in a recent interview. Why would you do that? They had written those kids off. Comma. Zero. Seventy-one ICI. C2. T. Seventy-two I8. Seventy-three five. J. Copyright. Figure 14.9 Out of Missouri's 520 school systems, Normandy is one of just two that are unaccredited. 448 Chapter 14 Education But for a moment prior to the start of Brown's senior year, the NOR 79 Mandy District's students were thrown an unlikely lifeline. Just two years after the merger with Wellston, Normandy's schools 80 were performing so poorly that the state stripped Normandy of its accreditation altogether. That triggered a state law requiring that any student there be allowed to transfer to an accredited district nearby. The law had been challenged by suburban districts uninterested in absorbing kids from failing schools, but in 2013 the Missouri State Supreme Court upheld it. For Nedra Martin, whose honors student daughter, Mehar I.A., was stuck 81 in Normandy's failing schools, the development was the miracle she had prayed for. Martin could not afford private schools, and her attempts to enroll her daughter in neighboring white districts had been rebuffed. Just like that, the court's decision erased the invisible, impenetrable eight leaders lines of segregation that had trapped her child. I was elated, Martin said. Just elated. Eighty-three parents in the school districts that would have to take Normandy's Stu 8, dense were not. Normandy had chosen to provide transportation for its transfers to attend Francis Howell, which was 85% white at the time and some 26 miles away. When Francis Howell officials held a public forum to address COM 85 munity concerns, more than 2,500 parents packed into the high school gymnasium. Would the district install metal detectors? What about the violence 86 their children would be subjected to, an elementary school parent asked. Wouldn't test scores plummet? The issue wasn't about race one parent said, but trash. Mehar I.A. Martin was sitting in the audience that night with her mother. One of the few brown faces in the audience, the rising eighth grader said she wiped away tears. It made me heartbroken because they were putting us in a box, said Mehar I.A., soft-spoken but firm, in recalling the episode. I was sitting there thinking, would you want some other parents talking about your kid that way? In the fall of 2013, nearly 1,000 Normandy students about a quarter of the district's enrollment fled to schools in accredited districts. More than 400, including Mehar IA, headed to Francis Howell. Mehar IA said that she was, in fact, welcomed by students and teachers at her new middle school. It was the first time in her life that she'd attended a district that had the full approval of the state. She thrived. And she was not alone. Despite the fears, recently released state data shows that, 
with the exception of one district, test scores in the transfer schools did not drop. But the success came with a perverse twist. The state required failing districts whose students were allowed to transfer to pay the costs of the Hannah Jones School Segregation 449 87 88 I comma 2 I D 89 I 2 C 90 I A 5 3 91 IQ 92 93 Children's education in the adjoining districts. For the wider, more affluent districts, it was a replay of what had happened during the court ordered desegregation plan, when transfer students were referred to as black gold, students the districts had to educate but who cost them nothing. The millions of dollars in payments to other districts drained nor 94 Mandy's finances. Within months, the district shuttered an elementary school and laid off 40% of its staff. Already deeply troubled, the Normandy schools were headed to insolvency. In order to save the district, they killed the district, said John Wright, 95 a longtime St. Louis educator who spent stints as superintendent in both St. Louis and Normandy. Recognizing the problem of student transfers, the state engineered 96 their end. This June, when students were on summer break, the state announced 97 that it was taking over the Normandy Public Schools District and reconstituting it as the Normandy Schools Collaborative. As a new educational entity, state officials said, the district got a clean slate. It no longer was unaccredited but operated under a newly created status as a state oversight district. The transfer program, the state claimed, no longer applied. One by one, 98 transfer districts announced that Normandy children were no longer welcome. Figure 14.10 Mehra Pruitt Martin, Center, an honors student, transferred out of Normandy last year but returned after the state tried to end student transfers to high-performing districts. In November, her mother pulled Mehra out of the Normandy schools again because she said she saw little improvement. 450 Chapter 14 Education Martin and her daughter were devastated. I honestly felt they were 99 blacklisting our children, Martin said. Martin and other parents sued, asserting the state had no legal author 100. ITY to act as it had. St. Louis lawyer Josh Schindler represented the parents. These are just families who want their kids to have a good educa 101 chin. Decent hard-working people who want their kids to have a chance. He said in an interview. This has been a decades-long battle. How are we going to remedy the situation? On August 15, after the new school year had begun in some districts, 102. A state judge granted a temporary injunction that allowed the plaintiffs to enroll their children in the transfer districts. Every day a student attends an unaccredited school, the judge wrote, 103. The child could suffer harm that cannot be repaired. The ruling brought a rush of relief to many parents. I cried and just held on to my kid, said Janine Crawford whose son was 105 able returned to the Pattonville School District. It meant that he was going to get a decent education. And it meant that I could take a deep breath. The state is still fighting the ruling, and Francis Howell required all 106 transfer students to obtain court orders to return.
Martin briefly returned Meharia to the Normandy schools after they 107 came under state oversight but found them little improved and has since sent her back to Francis Howell. The entire situation has only reinforced her cynicism and despair, she said. What about your neighbor? Is it so hard to embrace the children who tends? Clearly need your help right now, she asked. The whole way this was handled by the state on down was shysty and underhanded. They were not thinking about the children. The state's top education officials admit that the way they've dealt with 109. Normandy has laid bare racial divisions in St. Louis County and beyond. In an interview, Nicastro, the state superintendent, called it a low point. In her career, a blight and commentary about Missouri. When asked whether black children in Missouri were receiving in 110. Equal education, she paused, then inhaled deeply. Do I think black children in Missouri are getting in all cases the same education as their white counterparts? Nicastro said. I'd have to say no. 104. Little hope and a telling burial. On a cold, clear morning in November, with the grand jury still assess one geing the killing of Michael Brown, a group of black leaders and concerned citizens gathered in a classroom at Harris Stowe State University in downtown St. Louis. The school was founded in 1829 to train black teachers. The gathering produced a recommitment to the solution to Segrega I-12 Shin floated 30 years before, a single, unified school district for St. Louis and its suburbs. School segregation 451 but there was recognition that the answer would require a long and 113 uphill fight. We know what would have been best educationally for these kids we 114 always know what the best thing to do is. What we lack is the moral core. Age and political will to do it, said Jones, of the State Board of Education. If we had treated the civil rights movement the way we've treated the education of black children, we'd still be drinking out of colored drinking fountains. Separate but equal has not worked, Jones said. Not in St. Louis. Not us anywhere else. The school lines that advantage some and deprive others. He said, must be toppled. Students who spend their careers in segregated schools can look JJ6 forward to a life on the margins, according to a 2014 study on the long-term impacts of school desegregation by University of California, Burke. Lay economist Rucker Johnson. They are more likely to be poor. They are more likely to go to jail. They are less likely to graduate from high school, to go to college, and to finish if they go. They are more likely to live in segregated neighborhoods as adults. Their children are more likely to also attend segregated schools, repeat 117 in the cycle. Even in the fog of her grief, Michael Brown's mother spoke to this 11th struggle. With her son's body laying on the concrete behind police tape. Hannah Jones. C2. R. 85. I. Copyright underscore. Figure 14.11 High School. Michael Brown is buried in the cemetery that overlooks his old. 452 Chapter 14. Education. Leslie McSpadden cried, Do you know how hard it was for me to get him to stay in school and graduate? You know how many black men graduate, she implored. Not 119. Many. 
with a diploma from a district that one report called catastrophically under 120. Performing, her oldest son had been headed to nearby Vadaat College. Schools like Vadaat enroll a disproportionate percentage of black 121 students. Those who attend are often saddled with debt they cannot pay back. In 2013, a jury awarded more than $13 million to a single mother who sued Vadaat for misleading enrollment practices. An executive with Vadaat Educational Centers, Inc. said the company's 22 problems were in the past, and that it had reformed its admissions practices. Brown never made it to Vadaat. Maybe he would have bucked the 123 odds and found a way to master a trade and make a career. Today, Brown is buried in the old St. Peter's Cemetery. Right next to M. Normandy High School. 222. Reading as a writer, analyzing rhetorical choices. 1. What is Jim Crow, par of 15? Look it up, as well as Brown v. Board of Education, para 18, and share what you find. How do these historical references add to Hannah Jones's argument? To spend some time with the charts and the map included in this essay. Make sure you understand the information presented in each and its relationship to the rest of the essay. Explain at least one chart to appear. Writing as a reader, entering the conversation of ideas. 1. Nicole Hannah Jones shares a concern with Susan Dynarski, pages 427-29 and also with Sean F. Reardon, Jane Waldfogel, and Daphna Basak, pages 430-33, all of whom examine the impact of economic inequality on children's educations. Perhaps beginning with Hannah Jones's paragraph 8 is a helpful starting point, bring together these authors' ideas on the multiple aspects of persistent poverty that keep students from accessing meaningful education. Write an essay in which you analyze the ways these authors frame the problems and solutions, and assert your own position about what changes can or should be made, while addressing the challenges described in these readings. 2. Hannah Jones's analysis of racial and economic inequalities is interestingly in conversation with Barbara Ehrenreich's essay, pages 340-45 in Sociology about cultural attitudes toward poverty and Tana Heise Coates's essay, pages 20-24 in Chapter 1, about racial inequalities. Choose one of these authors to place in conversation with Hannah Jones, and craft an essay that uses insights and evidence from each author to make an argument about the relationship between these social inequalities and education. What is the significance of your findings? Sociology is the EST in the origi the present. As you threw a sociologic one we make about growingly insignificant ph. Sociology. How does studying human social behaviors help us understand ourselves and the world? Dash FFLT. FEAL. I dash colon. Mnons v. Eldens, or in C. Mulyard Taunt Dude, you're a fag.